there's a portrait of Galeazzo Maria Sforza, Sforza's father, Francesco Sforza. It's in Milan in the Brera. And on his chest, he has all of these rows of little pieces of metal. I had seen that portrait in reproduction or in person many, many, many times and never paid attention until I kept coming over and over again in documents and particularly letters, people talking about these small round metallic discs called magette or maillette. There was a huge production of them in Milan. They were sometimes made of brass. They were sometimes silver and gilded. They adorned men and women in all sorts of ways. Sometimes they were strung up as necklaces. They would be in the hundreds on sleeves. They're spangles or sequins, essentially, right? Or paillettes. Fashion historians might, you know, know them as paillettes that are used by all sorts of designers today and, and also in all sorts of textiles because they animate the textile. They both make noises and they also reflect light. And I've been reading about them, that men were wearing them, and they are right in front of me was lines and lines of these magette that no one had paid attention to. But again, original viewers would have thought that he was dashing and virile and, and very fashionable. It took deep reading of documents and familiarity with the adornments that these men were wearing to see something that was plain as day right in front of our eyes. That's it, isn't it? It's the familiarity. We're so guilty of it. I think the, the modern viewer is often much more fixated on the face and how well the artist might have captured a sitter you know, on their expression and on on what message the painter is trying to send. They're not looking at these fine details, which in fact would have been so important to the contemporary viewer, and yet would have been so everyday in their vocabulary, in their visual vocabulary. And things like, as you say, magette, you forget how expensive these would have been. You forget with machine cut metal now, machine hammered metal, you would have had to have somebody hammering that out, cutting those individual pieces, stitching them on individually, the pure expense. One of the things you talk about in your book so successfully is how people were reading these visual cues at court. Because it's not just the Lord himself who would be dressed to the absolute nines, it's also his retinue. Absolutely. And this is a point I like to make with students a lot. Generally today, we think that fashion is all about the individual. It's individual choice. It's about individual identity. But I try to get them to, to think of the ways that fashion is also corporate. It's also collaborative, that we're, we're trying to look like these other people and we're trying to look not like these other people. It's rarely just only about yourself, right? It's communicating sort of within groups. And that was absolutely the case in 15th century Italy, that fashion was collaborative. And these displays of lordship, these displays of magnificence and splendor were collaborative. But but they were also very hierarchical. So the prince and close family members had to be at the top and they would wear the most expensive velvets and, and be adorned with the most expensive gems and medals. But as you would go down, their courtiers too, they had to look good. And when you had a resident ambassador at another court, how they were dressed reflected back on the home court. So the Duke of Milan, I, I keep coming back to him, he outfitted his courtiers a couple of times a year. And so we have good records of what they were wearing. And certain levels of courtiers, for instance, would be given a garment in, say, a crimson dye, which would have been the most expensive. Others would be given the same garment and maybe a blue dye. Some would be given the garment gold brocaded, others silver brocaded. It was much more dynamic than just sort of static livery that a color meant this court that gradations of hierarchies of court were, were important too. And this prince, it was his duty to clothe the court. It was his duty to make the, the court look as magnificent and splendid as possible. 